Hello, everyone. Hello. Good evening. Uh, welcome to this latest installment of Fresno Writers Live. This is an online series to celebrate new books by Fresno Writers. I am very excited that you can join us here this evening. Uh, this is our second of four readings this summer for Fresno Writers Live. And tonight we're here to spend some time together with Steve Yabra and David Barofka and their excellent new books of fiction. I'm really excited that you could join us. My name is Jefferson Beavers, and I serve on the organizing committee of the Fresno State Creative Writing Alumni Chapter. I am very happy to welcome you to this Zoom space this evening. I would like to acknowledge that this broadcast is originating from Fresno and California, the traditional homelands of the Yokuts and Mono peoples. Since 2016, our Creative Writing Alumni Chapter has aimed to bring together Fresno writers across generations in both on-ground and online spaces uh, through events like these. Uh, we've been doing Fresno Writers Live online in particular uh, since the pandemic began in March 2020. It is great to see both familiar names uh, and some new names popping into the participants list tonight. Uh, so again, thanks for, for tuning in. Tonight's reading, we would like to make a very special dedication to. Uh, this is at the request of Steve and David and uh, Ethan, and I think it's a terrific uh, suggestion. Uh, tonight's reading, we are dedicating uh, to the late Francis Levine. And for those of you who are on the call who might not have heard the news, um, Franny uh, passed away last week here in Fresno at age 94. Uh, many of you know Franny as uh, the wife of our beloved poet laureate, uh, Philip Levine, who passed away in 2015. And uh, Franny, of course, uh, is that and much more, an amazing uh, artist, painter, uh, sketchbook designer. Uh, Franny is an incredible gardener, an amazing chef, a creative cookbook writer, and just an all around uh, generous and committed uh, community volunteer and amazing human. And uh, Fran will be deeply missed, deeply missed uh, in our community, in our writing community. Uh, Fresno State will have a, a tribute story, a remembered story about Franny that will be coming out tomorrow um, on the Fresno State News website. So if you are in the normal channels for the creative writing program, you'll see that link come along. Uh, if you're in the call tonight and you'd still like to receive that information, you're not kind of in the usual channels, just drop me a note in the chat or send me a message and I'll make sure that you get that. So um, tonight's reading with uh, Steve and David in honor of Francis Levine. So first I'd like to introduce you to Ethan Chatagne, your host tonight. Uh, Ethan is a Fresno State alumnus. He is the author of the forthcoming novel, Singer Distance, which will be out on Ten House Books in October. I'm really excited to get my hands on that book. Ethan is also the author of the story collection, Warnings from the Future, which is published by Acre Books in 2018. His stories have been published widely. Uh, he has a pushcart prize to his uh, many credits. And Ethan has volunteered with our creative writing alumni chapter since 2017, almost the entire time uh, that we've been organized as a group. Uh, so Ethan is usually the guy who's behind the scenes on these readings. And so it's also a real treat for me to have him on the host end tonight uh, to be featured alongside uh, David and Steve. So everyone, uh, please join me in welcoming uh, Ethan Chitanye. Hi everybody, thank you. Thank you, for, thank you Jefferson, thank you for being here. I think we've got a really excellent reading tonight with two writers I greatly admire and I'm very excited to introduce them. Uh, so uh, as Jefferson said, David's going to be up first. Let me give you a little bit of, of his background and talk to you a little bit about his new collection. David Barofka's first collection of stories, Hints of His Mortality, was selected by Oscar Huelos as the winner of the 1996 Iowa Award for Short Fiction. His novel, The Island, was published by McMurray and Beck. And his stories have appeared in Image, Massachusetts Review, Southern Review, Black Warrior Review, Missouri Review, Manoa, Gettysburg Review, and Shenandoah, among others. He has been the winner of the Missouri Review Editor's Prize, the Charles B. Wood Award from the Carolina Quarterly, the Emerging Writers Network Award, Prism Review's Fiction Prize, 
and Jabberwock Review's Nancy D. Hargrove Editor's Prize. A member of the faculty at Reedley College from 1983 until his retirement in 2019, He's also taught at the UCLA uh, Extension Writers Program, Fresno Pacific University, and at Fresno State. He and his wife, Deb, now divide their time between Clovis, California, and Ashen, Oregon, as well as any place where the fires aren't burning and the virus numbers are low. And he notes, may the earth and humanity heal. So is David's new collection, A Longing for Impossible Things, is full of characters who are confounded by life's refusal to offer them a coherent narrative and who are struggling to put one together. As one of his characters says, our eyes were opened and we saw color and chaos. Our ears were opened and, we, and all we heard was noise. But in that noise and color and chaos, he gives us an array of richly drawn lives. His collection is really funny and it's poignant and it's full of everything you want in a story collection. So without further ado, let me turn it over to David Barak. Thank you, Ethan. I appreciate that. And my thanks to Jefferson and everyone connected with Fresno Writers Live. Uh, this is such a treat to read and talk, uh, and especially in Steve's company. Uh, Steve and I have known one another for more than 30 years since the day that he did a book signing at the old Fig Garden bookstore for his first collection, uh, Family Man. And so now here we have Stagon Days, uh, how many books later? Um, and it's just one more fabulous book in Steve's over us. So I'm really grateful to be a part of tonight's uh, conversation. I'm going to read a couple of excerpts from the stories and a longing for impossible things. But first, in part, again, because of uh, our, you know, memory of uh, Franny uh, and her recent passing, I'm going to read a very brief essay that I wrote this past March which uh, in part explains a little bit about the backstory of the title of the collection, but also says something about my, uh, my relationship to poetry. Um, it's called The First Church of Poetry and Longing, Finding Consolation in Pessoa's uh, The Book of Disquiet. As I write this, Ukrainians and their beloved cities and countryside are being bombed and killed indiscriminately. And it hardly feels appropriate to speak of anything else. Lesser concerns pale in importance. And yet poetry reminds us of the deeper truths of life, so much so that on March 6th, the New York Times ran an interactive exegesis of Auden's Musée des Beaux-Arts on the front page of their website. A cautionary tale from a poet of the last world war, reminding us that the tension between extraordinary evil and the commonplaces of the everyday occurs, well, every day, if only we have the eyes to see it and the willingness to confront it. I turn to the poets for such truths, and yet no one would ever confuse me for a poet. For that matter, no one would ever confuse me as a particularly gifted reader of poetry. In fact, my experience in poetry workshops during my grad school years firmly convinced me that neither line nor scansion was my friend. Not the image, nor the metaphor. A sonnet made more sense to me as a snack than it did as a form. The honest to God poets of my grad school acquaintance seemed to me to occupy a realm better described by politicians and hucksters rather than writers. They spoke a language of which I only understood every third word. And they seemed to feel that white space on the page was a product for which they could rightfully claim ownership. Let's face it, they didn't type very well, nor did they need to. Better for them the use of quill pens. If I found any comfort in whatever inferiority I felt as a writer of fiction, I found it in Charles Baxter's essay, Rhyming Action, in which he contrasts the poets and the prose writers with observations such as these. Poets think that a household mess is picturesque. For them, it's the contemporary equivalent of a field of daffodils. The poets start the party and dance the longest, but they don't know how to plug in the stereo system and they have to wait for the prose writers to show them where the on off switch is. In general, poets do not know where the on off switch is anywhere in life. 
they are usually off unless they are forcibly turned on and they stay on until they are taken to the emergency room where they are medicated and turned off again. But then my wife and I landed in Fresno, home to such poets as Philip Levine, Peter Everwine, Chuck Hanslicek, Connie Hales, and all the acolytes who had come through their workshop doors in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Fresno, a training ground for poets as well as almond growers. Fresno is also home to the community-based Fresno Poets Association, where poets came from all over, Audrey and Rich, Sharon Olds, even the occasional fiction writer was invited to join the fun, and my wife said that the monthly Thursday evenings were reserved for going to the Church of Poetry, in which poetry, like a contemporary humanistic scripture, points us toward a better sense of ourselves. And if I didn't know the words or understand the tune, I could certainly hum along in my own good, tone-deaf and wrong-footed time. All of which is to say, if I didn't get poets or certain poems, and if I thought poets were running some kind of scam, not unlike the emperor's sartorial choices, some of those poems got me, wormed their way in, filled me with their spirit, and in ways for which I wasn't always prepared. To the point that in my first collection of stories, there were unsubtle references to Wordsworth, James Wright, and Robert Lowell, in the titles alone. And in my first novel with its plot cribbed from Shakespeare's Tempest, there was also a glancing swipe at Dunn. Conscious but unaware may serve as an epitaph on my tombstone. Slow learner could also serve as its subtitle. Fast forward 20 plus years to the present and a new collection of stories submitted under a variety of titles. Once a finalist for the Flannery O'Connor and another a finalist for the inaugural Jordan Prize. Congratulations, the emails read. You almost won. In despair, after the latest bridesmaid finish, I went looking for a new title and a new organization of the stories. And it was at that moment that I, slow learner indeed, encountered for the first time the shadowy and shape-shifting poet Fernando Pessoa, whose entries in the Book of Disquiet as translated by Richard Zenith, provided me with a new title and an epigraph that may have told me as much about myself as it did the poet from whom they came. The feelings that hurt most, the emotions that sting most are those that are absurd. The longing for impossible things, precisely because they are impossible, Nostalgia for what never was, the desire for what could have been, regret over not being someone else, dissatisfaction with the world's existence. All these half tones of the soul's consciousness create in us a painful landscape, an eternal sunset of what we are. As one friend, much more rational than I, pointed out, there's an ambiguity at the heart of such observations. How can one long for something that is by definition impossible? How do we seek that which we've never encountered or known directly? On the other hand, in one of the poems authored by one of his many alter egos, the heteronym Alberto Cairo, he writes as though in confession, the frightful reality of things is my everyday discovery. Each thing is what it is. He might as well be speaking in the present tense, writing the history that we are now living. Wouldn't we rather turn to Wordsworth or the Platonists to find comfort, if not hope? And yet such ambiguities and contradictions seem to be the crux of consciousness from Pessoa's perspective as Zenith puts it in his masterful biography, the whole of our human drama being a mere analog of some other sort of life. Is this so different from that early church verse and hymn to God, unuttered thou, all uttered things have had their birth from thee, the one unknown from thee the springs of all we know and see. 
What we know and see in this moment are the atrocities of war happening, it is true, and an af affirmation of Auden to others. But we long for the impossible and the unknown. Oh, to make peace with the frightful reality of things. Oh, to pierce the veil that separates us from that other better sort of life. So that's a little bit of the reasoning behind the title since there is no story in the collection with that name. Uh, that epigraph kind of grabbed me and wouldn't let me go because it seems like it kind of captures something that, that seems to go on with a lot of the characters that I write about. They're strivers for something, a something that is possibly nebulous and vague and ambiguous. That sense that there's something out there, possibly as something as yet undefined and unknown, whether it be God, a lover, an achievement of some kind, a word on the tip of the tongue that is never quite found, but always known, the answer to a question that can't be fully articulated. The first story in the collection is fairly representative of such striving. And the narrator of my life as a mystic is probably as good an emblem as any. And here are uh, the opening sections of that story. Once upon a time, I was very religious. I saw angels in my bathwater, and when I opened the front door, birds would roost upon my shoulders. Well, no, I can't tell you that, not truthfully. I was prepared for it, however. The birds, the angels, God speaking to me in a hushed and confidential tone. Me and him, he and I with secrets to share. That was the life I had envisioned for myself. Now and again, driving to work on a bright and sunny day in early spring, I was sure that God would step out onto the highway and flag me down, illumination as hitchhiker. In those moments, my head would get so light, my mood so euphoric, I feared for my sanity. But a doctor friend, a shrink, claimed that these incidents were nothing more than a manic phase. Wait a bit, he told me, it's early yet. My wife, on the other hand, insisted that I was experiencing an electrolyte imbalance. Drink some Gatorade, you'll feel better. I felt fine, I insisted. The air was nectar, the sky ambrosia, God was dancing in the peach blossoms. She patted my hand as though consoling a stroke victim. Jesus, I said, give me a break. Not now, dear, said my wife, assured of her hold over me, maybe later. This went on year after year. If I saw two sides of an oak leaf dancing back and forth on its branch, I knew God lived on the other side of the breeze, surely, but he always stayed that one breath away. On occasion, I acted less than responsibly, according to my wife, at least. One evening, I drove into a pasture by accident while looking at the moon, a fat silver disc swimming in aquamarine twilight. It looked like a doorway into another dimension. Then the car went up and over a barbed wire fence and tipped nose first into an irrigation ditch. My head hit the steering wheel and the lights went out. When I woke, water was lapping at my feet and the car, a Buick, my father's last before he died, was beginning to shift against the current. His displeasure with what I had done to his inheritance was palpable, the taste of blood coating my mouth. I was distracted, I said, scrambling out of my seatbelt. The bank was packed dirt, but wet and slippery and climbing it was no easy matter. A primitive life form of life rising from the ooze, hands and feet, elbows and knees. Three cows stood placidly by, thoughtfully observing from the other side of the ditch bank. Thank God for cell phones. Moron, I heard my father say space cadet. I'm open to new experience. I spit out a tooth. Is that such a bad thing? 
You never could focus, always lost in your own little world, nothing but fantasies. I could never figure things out, not like you could. Ha, he snorted, one of the courtroom tactics calculated to rattle me, his most recalcitrant witness. You just didn't apply yourself. An old argument, my failure in law school, where I couldn't get through the most elementary course in contracts. I sat in classrooms late at night, surrounded by the drone of precedent and statute, but listening for a melody no one else could hear. I lasted most of the first semester until I started having breathing problems. The classroom door closed, my chest tightened, and I'd have to get away, a prisoner escaping his keepers and cell. You had the mind, my father grumped. A tow truck idled next to the ditch, red lights blinking above the cab, the driver hooking cables to the undercarriage of my father's former car. But not the heart, I said, I never did. The one decision that pleased my father was my marriage. Jenna, he said, had enough gumption for both of us. My mother approved of Jenna as well for similar reasons. She'll keep your feet on the ground, Charlie, my mother said. We were sitting on the patio across from each other, our drinks on the glass top table, serving as intermediaries. You need that, you know, otherwise you're liable to float away. I've been afraid one of these days I'd look up at the sky and it would be, oh, look, there goes Charlie. Jenna won't let that happen. A tax attorney for Kneebolt, Brand, and Marcus, Jenna spent that first evening tossing back slugs of Johnny Walker with my father and trading stories about the worst judgments they'd ever received, while my mother started a preliminary guest list for the wedding. I wandered the backyard watching the shadows of the palm trees make fingers along the back fence before taking off my shoes, rolling up my pants legs, and sticking my feet into the swimming pool hoping the water would be more than just wet. It wasn't. No matter that it chucked against the tiles like laughter, the pool lights playing hide and seek in the folds of its surface, or that it burped in the skimmers, the water was only wet. No more nor less than the water that poured from my father's Buick when the tow truck lowered the back end down in our driveway. Why should have I expected anything different? Jenna watched from the front door, her hands on her hips. Forget to look at the road again, she said. Take the turn off for the highway to heaven. Well, Charlie is something of a lost, lost case, maybe a lost cause too. Uh, looking, 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 but never quite finding. Even the answers he does receive are a little like those quote unquote consolation miracles in Marquez, not quite on point. If my life as a mystic is the product of a consciousness from 20 years earlier, then maybe the counterpoint to Charlie is the narrator of attachments for the platonically inclined, the last story in the collection. I should maybe mention the following. I had when I wrote that story, I had retired nine months earlier, and I was just beginning to feel that I'd figured out what I was doing with myself and my time. I had just finished the draft of a novel, for example, but then the pandemic hit. My wife was sent home to work from our dining room table, and she was threatening to take everything in the house to recycling. In something like desperation, I made a list of disparate objects I wanted to include in a story for a narrator who would see those objects as the markers of meaning in his confused and disordered life. And this is the beginning of attachments for the platonically inclined. I'm not going to sugarcoat it or try to explain it away. I acted badly in this era of the pandemic and social distancing. She was cleaning as a way to keep busy, use the time and be productive at home but I should mention that nearly every bad thing I have ever done happened when Francie was cleaning, even in the best of times, because for her cleaning means disposal rather than scrubbing or dusting or washing. 
Sometimes the frenzy becomes too much for her and me. This is a fact that must be acknowledged and in my case, accommodated. Over the years, she has thrown or given away many, many things, but the cast-offs for this particular moment have been especially telling. Clothing, the plaid sport coat I wore when I received the Jablonski Prize as a high school senior. Kitchen appliances, my George Foreman hamburger grill, and sports accessories, a roto grip bowling ball with which I bowled my only 300 game. Don't get me wrong, she gets rid of her own things as well. These are merely the latest examples of the hundreds of items that have made their way to Goodwill, the Salvation Army, American Veterans, the Hospice Thrift Store, not to mention our local landfills. And I name them only because they were once mine and I remember them, sometimes with fondness, sometimes with regret. The fury of her cleaning and disposal makes me nervous for reasons I don't entirely understand. I'm not threatened by the loss of my material possessions alone. I hadn't worn that jacket in nearly 50 years, for example. So its time was clearly past the expiration date. But I am threatened by what that loss represents, the memory of what lives within those objects and the sense that history is being scrubbed free of the presence of my past. Who could forget you, she asked. I mean, really. You're 65 years old and you're in all the yearbooks, but you're such a drama queen. You act like the child who hasn't been chosen. Oh, sure, I said, easy for you to say, Miss Easy Come, Easy Go, Little Miss Sophomore Girl. I happen to know for a fact that she has jewelry she wore when she was 10. It's squirreled away in a bag at the bottom of a cedar chest and she would no more wear it now than she would wear Mickey Mouse ears but it would break her heart to see it go. Maybe though, maybe I take this too much to heart. We get stuff, we get rid of stuff, stuff is not us. I should be able to turn the page, right? Turning the page, that's, that's key, I think. Uh, the problem is none of my characters quite know how to do it. Uh, they keep reading the same words over and over, somehow hoping that the story turns out differently with a little revelation on the side for good measure. Holy fools or just fools, I'm not sure the distinction matters. Thanks again, Jefferson, for the invitation. And thanks again to Ethan for the introduction. And thanks to all of you for tuning in. And I'll turn it back over to Ethan. All right, thank you, David. That was really great. I always love hearing you read your uh, your characters. Have a particular talent for a, a good cutting remark and some good good repartee. Uh, all right. Uh, next up, we have Steve Yarbrough, uh, and I, I'm very excited to be able to introduce him. Steve was one of my very first fiction writing teachers, and I'm still thinking about the the lessons and anecdotes from his class, you know, twenty something years later, and. Uh, you know, often passing them off to my, my writing group, <laughs> partially as my own. Um, so Steve is the author of 12 books, including the novels, The Unmade World, The Realm of Last Chances, Safe from the Neighbors, The End of California, Prisoners of War, Visible Spirits, and The Oxygen Man, and the short story collections, Veneer, Mississippi History, and Family Man. He is the recipient of numerous awards, including the Mississippi Institute of Arts and Letters Award for Fiction, the California Book Award, the Richard Wright Award, and the Robert Penn Warren Award. He's been a finalist for the Penn Faulkner Award and is a member of the Fellowship of Southern Writers. The Unmade World won the 2019 Massachusetts Book Award for Fiction. The son of Mississippi Delta cotton farmers, Steve is a professor emeritus of English at Fresno State and is currently a professor in the Department of Writing, Literature, and Publishing at Emerson College. I was so happy when this book arrived in the mail because you, uh, if, for those of you who've already been reading Steve Yarbrough, uh, you know that when you start a Steve Yarbrough novel, you're going to be immersed. So for a few weeks, you're gonna be living in Mississippi or the Central Valley or Boston or Poland, or in this case, all four. So Stay Gone Days follows two sisters from their childhood in Mississippi that lighten their lives in a journey that you kind of have no choice but to follow through to the end. 
I'm also excited to announce this because Steve is uh, coming to us from Poland a bit after 3 a.m. And so I get to do like a Saturday Night Live style uh, introduction for him. So live from Krakow, it's Steve Yarbrough. Great. Can you all hear me okay? All right. Um, it's, it's wonderful to get to come back to Fresno um, because in a very real way, pretty much everything um, about my writing life that matters started in Fresno. Um, and for me, you know, I wouldn't be here tonight had I not been in, in Fresno for 21 years. It's great to get to read with Dave. Um, when I blurbed his collection, I said, and I meant from the bottom of my heart, that I think he's one of the finest short story writers we've ever had in America. Um, and I had not gotten to read Ethan's forthcoming novel yet, but I read his collection and he is every bit as good as I knew he was gonna be many, many years ago. So thanks for having me back, Jefferson, and thanks to everyone for coming tonight. I'll read a few pages from the novel. Um, there have been three pairs of sisters who were really uh, and remain really important in my life. Um, two of them are my daughters. And, uh, you know, I think there's a little bit of both of them in this novel. Um, they're very different from one another. Another couple of sisters of my wife and her sister, um, who again, they don't look alike, they don't think alike, they don't talk alike, um, and yet they came from the same household. And then my friend Linnea, who's here tonight, um, obviously, you know, really important to me, as was her sister Connie. I don't know if there's a whole lot of them in the book, um, but I think there's probably some of each, of each of these people in the book. So in the case of my sisters in this novel, their lives start like mine did in the Mississippi Delta. Um, one of them ends up in California, as I did. One of them ends up in Boston. Um, then the one who ended up in California ends up in in Poland, where I am now. You will notice it's not as dark as it was when we started. That's because the sun comes up here about 3.30 in the morning, which is a real treat. Um, so uh, this pair of sisters have had something really bad happen to them in their childhood. Um, and I'm gonna read this little section from up front. Um, so, They're sitting in algebra when it happens, together again in the only class they share, Ella on one side of the room, Caroline on the other. The teacher is explaining why pi can never be expressed as the quotient of two integers. Neither girl is paying attention. Ella is gazing at the back of the girl directly in front of her, willing herself not to look at the front row where Brad Moss is sitting in the seat she used to occupy. Caroline is reading the paperback novel hidden behind her open textbook, something called One for the Gods, about a romantic triangle between two men and a woman who yacht around the Mediterranean screwing for and aft. She can't imagine how this wretched book found its way onto the book rack at Mr. Quick, but it did and she appropriated it a couple of days ago. Sometimes you have to make do. The intercom crackles and the principal's voice oddly subdued says, we need the coal girls down in the office. 24 pairs of eyes watch the two of them rise. Each of the sisters resists the urge to glance at the other both of them knowing that whatever led to this summons can't possibly be anything good. I believe in propane. That's what the sign on the wall behind the desk of their father's boss says. Everybody in the town knows this, though few of them have seen it. 
They only see what you see when you enter through the front to pay your bills. There are always limits to what the public knows. The public finds out some things and invents the rest, depending on the story it wants to tell itself. In the months and years ahead, Ella will invent her own version of this May morning too. A version that will be revised many times, depending on numerous factors, chief among them, her mood and the moments in which she reimagines it. The only thing that never changes is the ending. As she sees it, their father walks into the office at the rear of the building to learn that for the third time this week, Mr. Barkley chose to sleep late and hand the morning's duties off to his son, William. All of 22, William is wearing a crisp, white, long sleeve shirt and a blue tie that looks like real silk. His dad's making him work at the plant for a year before he returns to Vanderbilt to earn his MBA. How are you this morning, Mr. Cole? William asks. Just fine, William. What about you? Young Barkley lifts a stack of papers, taps it against the desktop, then lays the stack right back where it was. Franklin woke me at 4.30. I don't know what set him off. Well, it's not strange to know the name of your employer's German Shepherd, her father might be thinking. It is odd for his son to assume that you do, or that if by chance you don't, you should. Probably a cat, he helpfully offers. Maybe so. To make matters worse, Mr. Majori is not feeling well. He called in sick. Mr. Majori is the father of Erwin, a boy who kissed Ella on the turn row once. I bet it's his gallbladder, she hears her father say. It's been acting up. Ricky Majori, her father once told her mother, would love to have his gallbladder removed just as he would love to have his prolapse discs repaired, but he has no health insurance. Barclay Petroleum doesn't provide it. Like her parents, he's insured his kids, but that's about all he can do. At any rate, some of his scheduled deliveries are pretty pressing. This lady, Ella sees William Barclay consult a scrap of paper then point at the name on it with a neatly clipped nail. She's been pretty insistent. Three calls since last Friday. Mrs. Pace, oh my, look at that, a giggle. Grace, Grace Pace, and she lives on the Quiver River? Still grinning, he looks up at her dad. That's so funny, don't you think so? Did her father, as William will report to Mr. Barkley and numerous others, really get a strange look on his face before replying, yeah, it's doggone hilarious. Nearly 40 years from now, she will finally gaze upon the remains of the Paces farmhouse on the east bank of the Quiver River. Anybody inclined to disbelief, assuming they have access to an old phone book, or the inclination to research county records can look up the address. Grady and Grace Pace, 100 Quiver River Road, Loring, Mississippi. At one time, her father knew that house as well as his own. He and Grady Pace went to school together. They played football and baseball together and neither of them was very good. They both served in Korea. That was where their respective fates diverged. Alton Cole joined the Navy and never heard a shot fired. Grady Pace, on the other hand, could not swim. Inducted into the Army, he ended up in Task Force Faith and became one of the unit's 385 infantrymen who, sur who survived the Battle of Chosen Reservoir. The Weekly Times published an article about him after he returned. Unfortunately, frostbite cost him three toes on one foot, two on the other, and much of the equilibrium that comes with having five on each. Grady Pace used to fall a lot. 
It began to happen as soon as he returned home to help on his father's place. He'd climb down off their Alice Chalmers and fall on his face. That was bad enough, but at least he could put his hand out to lessen the impact. Finally, a little more than 10 years before the day William Barclay dispatched her father to deliver their gas, Mr. Pace fell over backwards. It wasn't out there on their farm. It was in the sanctuary of Quiver River Baptist Church while he and another deacon moved along the center aisle, picking up the collection plates and handing them to people in the next row. He banged his head on a hardwood pew. Now, on this particular morning in May of 75, his brain is no longer able to send certain signals to his legs. He's been confined to a wheelchair since November of 64. You could read about that in the Weekly Times too. Her father has never made a delivery to the Paces. Before they were on Ricky Majori's route, they were on someone else's. But due to Mr. Majori's gallbladder, which he can't get rid of because the Affordable Care Act is several decades away, there's nothing to do but head out there. With any luck, he must be thinking, he'll be able to fill their tank and escape unnoticed. The tank's not all that close to their house. She sees him climb into the old bobtail. Soon he's out on the countryside near, uh, countryside near where he was raised, driving down a narrow gravel road. The land out here is some of the worst in the county. Too much acid in the ground, she once heard him say. The only things that grow well are red vines, teaweed, cockleburrs, and Johnson grass. It's hard to forge a life out here farming, but Grady and Grace Pace have attempted it with predictable results. He crosses the rickety bridge over the quiver. Normally, the first thing he does after starting the truck is to turn on his CB. Did he do that this morning? Has he already heard her voice crackling over the Johnson white face? Amazing Grace, KBR 7945. He's been hearing her for years. Ella watches the bobtail slow down as he approaches their place. He drives past the house toward the tractor shed and nearby storage tank. He pulls up to the tank. He shuts off the motor. He jumps out. He slams the door. It isn't as if he never encounters her. One Saturday last fall, according to the owner of Loring Hardware, her father was in the store trying to find a part for their leaking toilet when he heard her voice. I need a box of Remington 20 gauges, birdshot will do. An old stray's been hanging around. I don't want to kill it if I can run it off. Word will have it that her dad hunkered down in the plumbing section, pretending to examine various wax rings until she left, that he remained there for over half an hour, probably hoping she'd be in the pickup and gone by the time he reached the street. He walked out without buying anything, which amused the hardware on. At home, in a safe spot where he thinks they will never be found, her dad has all the letters he wrote to Grace when he was in the army, as well as the ones she wrote him. When she returned the ones he had written, did she ask for hers back? If so, he must have lied and said he'd lost them or destroyed them or whatever. The other thing he has is a handful of letters he wrote her years later, after Mr. Pace was already in the wheelchair. It will subsequently emerge that she gave those letters back only after Mr. Pace learned of their existence. Her, th her father must have created commotion pulling up to that tank. The Paces have a dog, which has crept out from under their house and is barking his head off. The dog no doubt annoys their father, who must have been hoping that he could complete the task he was sent to perform and escape without confrontation. She sees him hurry to the rear of the truck to release the filler hose. 
she watches as temptation gets the best of him and he risks a single glance at their house. Grace Pace is standing on the back porch staring at him. She's got on a pair of faded jeans and a tie-dyed t-shirt like she's some kind of hippie though she's 42 years old. Even from this distance, he must see the freckles that cover her arms and face. Her hair is still short and still reddish orange, and she's still puffing Paul Malls because when was she not? That's one thing everyone can agree on, even Mr. Pace. Mrs. Pace continues to stand there observing their father as he reels out the hose. What's going through his mind? Is he thinking that if she were to say, come on, Alton, let's jump in that truck and take off across the big river and never look back? He'd climb into the bobtail with her and disappear, leaving his wife and daughters behind? Or is he thinking that in life you have to make choices, that as bad as he wants her, he made his choice and plans to honor it? Either is possible. It's wrong to exclude the latter just because the former yields more drama. Grace opens the screen door and steps off the porch. Alton Cole holds that hose, watching her walk toward him. When she's close enough for him to see sunlight glinting off both her damp cheeks, she says, where's Majori? You're not supposed to be here, Alton. You know you're not supposed to. She gestures over her shoulder with her cigarette. Grady saw you out the window. He's fit to be tied. Who in God's name needs to be tied when he's already stuck in a wheelchair? Ricky had a gallbladder attack. Ella hears her father say, you've been hollering for gas and I'm the only driver available. What do you want me to do, Grace? The world is so goddamn fair, she believes her father is thinking. Not only can he not have the only woman he's ever loved, he can't even get a business card printed right. Just let me do my job, he says. Leave me the fuck alone and I'll be away from here and gone. He gives the refill hose a mean-spirited jerk slamming the brass nozzle against a badly corroded release valve. Vaporized propane shoots from the tank that Grady Pace will tell the Weekly Times he and Alton Cole used to straddle his boys, pretending it was a stallion they could ride to kingdom come. Grace has just taken another puff of her cigarette when the gas hits her in the face and she and Ella's father both go up in flames. Thank you. All right, thank you, Steve. That was fantastic as always. Uh, and the whole book is fantastic. And it's uh, uh, the Stay on Days is a, a book that deals in a lot of the characters' lives. It, it follows them from a young age and to, to uh, you know, through a, major portions of their lives and major turns um, and so it's something I, I recommend everyone pick up and and follow through to follow these these two sisters through everything that happens in their lives so we are going to be be starting a q a here in a minute if anyone has questions that they would like to ask to david or steve or both uh, please feel free to drop them in the chat and we'll agree oh i, I have some questions of my own that, that i'll i'll kick some things off with but um, please please any questions that you have, anything that you want to hear from these two, uh, let, uh, let us know in the chat and we will pass those questions along. Uh, so my first question is uh, for kind of for both of you, both of your books deal a lot in disruptions to characters' lives and in, in unexpected turns of fates and changes of plans and, and ending up somewhere that you didn't necessarily intend to. So I, I'd be interested in hearing from both of you how those play into fiction and, and why those are important in, in literature. Why are those important things to deal with? Okay. 
Okay, sure. Uh, make me go first. Um, you know, I think uh, it, it's the old story that uh, without without irritation, there is no fiction. Um, friction makes fiction, and you know, so th that notion of disruption, that notion of um, uh, dissatisfaction, I think, is what drives just about every story I know. Um, you know, the, the perfect life does not make for a, a good reading experience. Yeah, um, I couldn't agree more. My, my friend Larry Brown, who um, has been dead for quite a few years, but Larry used to say, no trouble, no story. Um, and I think that's very much true, you know. I mean, how, how interesting can you, uh, can you find just sitting on the couch gazing at your navel, really? Uh, uh, David, in, in your collection, um, a lot of your characters feel like they have sort of like, you mentioned this in your, your own introduction to the book and your exploration of it, of its themes. A lot of the characters are kind of finding their own direction in life, that they have trouble articulating what that is or, or kind of figuring out where they want to head or how to get there. Um, but the collection doesn't feel like it's looking with, with any kind of judgment upon that, but it's really engaging with that. And I was wondering it, kind of what you think the value is of a certain amount of driftlessness. Well, <laughs> now, this gets maybe more self-revelatory than I would feel comfortable with, but um, I, you know, I do feel that way with a lot of my own experience. Just, I don't know where I'm going half the time. Uh, plans are made and then plans are not able to be followed. And I think, you know, for, for, just about every character I write, I find myself kind of exploring that in one one way or another. Um, just this notion that, um, uh, you know, I, I sort of wish I, I got to live life a second time as a way of saying, well, all the things I learned the first time, maybe I'd figure it out. Uh, the next time, it's a little bit like raising children. Um, you know, you'd sort of like to, you know, maybe do it over again uh, with with what you know in hindsight. Um, but I, I do, you know, I, that's just the way I feel with, with pretty much everything in my life is that I don't, I don't really know what's going on uh, half the time. And I just kind of stumble along and so do the, the characters I write about. I've got another question for you from the chat from Deborah Rosenberg. Uh, she says, oh, that's it. Uh, she says she's wondered, your stories seem like a new kind of short story, more character sketch in a series of events. And she asked if you could tell us more about that. Well, I think a lot of this has to do with just, um, you know, again, uh, rather than the kind of short story or, or even novel for that matter, that, that charts a really well-defined arc of events. I just don't see life that way. I see life as being kind of a series of vignettes that sometimes make sense, but most of the time they don't until maybe looked at a long time later in retrospect. And um, so if, if anything, I'm just trying to give, um, uh, you know, give the characters that opportunity to try to find their way in what sometimes seems to be a relatively meaningless set of circumstances, not all of which have explosions going off. I mean, I love Steve's reading just because we we do have an explosion. That's that's the fun thing there. Um, and uh, but most of uh, most of my characters would would really die to die in such a glorious way. Um, they, they're they're probably just going to fall over and hit their heads, and that's about it. All right, thank you. A uh, question from Carol Vitale for both authors. Um, one of your characters surprised you the most. Hmm. Well, um, I, I don't 
I don't know that I can say when a particular character has surprised me the most, but I, I do know one thing, and that is that um, if I start a story or a novel and it goes exactly like I originally thought it was going to go, I'm in trouble. Um, because if, if the characters never take a, a wrong turn, um, I think I'm probably not going to be writing with much enthusiasm and I'm probably going to bore myself to death. I used to, when I was younger, have a notion that the story should go just the way I had planned it. And it was Andre Debuse who um, once asked me, you know, if you outline a story, how do you think your characters can surprise you? And I said, they don't. And Andre said, oh, you better hope they figure out how to. And I really didn't understand what he was talking about, but now I do. Um, and so I'm always, I think if you're receptive to the surprise, um, that's a good zone to get in. And I think most writers have to learn how to get into that zone. Yeah, and I would, I would maybe, the last little piece that I read um, from attachments for the platonically inclined, I literally started that story without a, a, a thought about what it was, where it was gonna go, what it was about. I just said, I want a story that includes a plaid sport jacket, a George Foreman grill and uh, a bowling ball and uh, figure out a way to make it work. And, uh, I, you know, the biggest thing was I just tried not to think about it too much and just let the character tell me where it was gonna go. That's great. That's great. I got another question uh, for both of you from Stephen Church. Uh, he says, one question we always come back to in my classes, so what is what is voice? But you each seem to intuitively understand it and master it. So how would you define it if you had to? Then he adds, maybe that's like asking uh, Steph Curry how he shoots a jump shot, but, but we'll have you guys do your best. Well, this is going to sound very mystical, but um, the way I think of it is that I'm listening to the story or I'm listening to the novel. And if, if I am receptive to the story, where the story seems to want to go, voice tends to take care of itself. Um, I don't think about it as much as I did when I was younger. And I just think that to a very, to a very large extent, and I'm grateful to Stephen for throwing that sports metaphor in here because I love sports metaphors. And, you know, living in Boston, you used to hear people say, Tom Brady makes great decisions, meaning he throws the ball to the right place. He holds the ball about 2.5 seconds before he throws it. And to me, that's not a decision. A decision is we're going to get divorced or we're going to sell our house. And that's not what Brady's doing. He's trained himself to respond to a certain set of stimuli. If he sees the cornerback's hips rotated one way, he goes over there, you know? And I think what, what we're trying to do with every word we write and uh, every word we read is internalize the mechanisms by which writing choices get made so that we're not just sitting there thinking about it. It happens. And that's, that's the truest thing I can say about the way it goes for me. I'm, I'm not thinking really about voice. Yeah, I guess I would say that, that uh, maybe one of the more meaningful words I've ever heard used to describe a storytelling voice, John Cheever was once talking about this and he used the word velocity. He wanted a story to move. And I would probably add one other word to that, and that would be density, because I really want the story to really move, but I also want it to have a kind of density of language that makes it interesting, yet not at the same time clotted and coagulated. Um, and so uh, th those are kind of my barometers of, of voice. But here again, it really is like Steve says, it's, a, it's more of an intuitive, um, uh, listening as much as it is uh, we're, we're listening to a voice that we put down on the paper and, and not that somehow we're creating it on our own. 
Great, I love both those answers. And I love the, the voice that comes through in, in both, uh, both of these books. Um, I had another question for Steve uh, about, about Stay Gone Days. Um, I was thinking as I, as I read this book and especially as I came into the end of it, um, that this one felt a little different than some of your previous novels in, the, in kind of the length of time that it, it stayed with these characters for and the way it, it stayed with them through many different stages and chapters of their lives. Um, in, a, in a way that kind of reminded me of something like Elena Ferrante's Neapolitan Cortez or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I was wondering with this book, did you set out with kind of a different narrative impulse or a different way of, of inhabiting the story uh, than you usually do? Yeah, I, I really did. Um, and let me, and most of the time when I've read, I've I've read the first page or so. Let me read the first paragraph and, and as, a, as a way of getting into an answer. In Ella's recollections, their house stands on the east side of the gravel road, a cotton field to the north, an orchard to the south. It's a boxy little two bedroom with sheetrock siding, hot in spring and summer, cold in fall and winter. They had a window unit, but it mostly just made noise. They had a fireplace too but it stayed boarded up because one time they found a dead snake there. Um, the third word in the novel is recollections. And so what I wanted to do was, um, you know, establish the fact that the part of the novel we're reading there is something that happened long in the past. And, um, you know, I, I did something I don't think I've ever done before in a novel, which is to, to um, use a lot of flash forwards, especially early in the book, because I wanted to alert the reader that this book was going to cover a lot of ground. Now, most of my novels have started in either July or August, and they've ended in December or January. And I used to wonder why and then I realized it's the structure of a football season. Um, so, you know, as, as John O'Hara said, once a writer figures out what it is that he does, he should stop doing it. And so my last couple of novels have been a lot more expansive because I felt like I was uh, getting too predictable and I needed to try something a little different. So yeah, I knew, I knew how much ground it was going to cover. All right, yeah, that's um, it, it's great to see the mix of how things were, and yeah, the unmade world, the your previous novel was was covering a lot of ground as well, and then it felt like you were going mm -hmm. even more with that here. So it's been it's been exciting to to see. Uh, let me take a look at we made one or two more questions. If anyone from the audience has as a last question or so, um, we should have time to take that. Uh, and uh, I'll give a little bit of time if anyone wants to drop something in the chat. And otherwise I'll, I'll gather a final question. All right, I get to ask him. Uh, so uh, the, let's, let's close out with the last question about teaching. You both have, have long and storied teaching careers. I'd love to hear about any ways in which your work teaching has informed the way you write or directed it in any way. Steve, you're still teaching, so I think you should go first. <laughs> well, um, in at least a couple of ways, and it, it's something that happens almost daily or weekly, depending on the teaching schedule. Um, I, see a, I see a student doing something that's just, you know, phenomenal. Maybe it's only a line or maybe it's a scene, uh, maybe it's an image. And it's, it's just a galvanizing moment where you, you have the shock of uh, the, the surprise of familiarities, as strange as that may sound. And it just always makes me remember why this is such a glorious thing to do. It gets me excited. Um, I also see, see people making 
clear and obvious mistakes. And um, it's, it's rare for me not to then immediately think, I just did that. Um, and it makes me aware of, you know, of things that might be going wrong in my own writing that I didn't see initially. So I know a lot of people who say they, they don't find it possible to teach and write. But for me, the two have really always gone together. Not that, you know, not that I had any choice because I've, I've never gotten rich off my writing, but um, they go hand in hand for me. Yeah, and I, you know, I would say that the one thing that I, you know, for 35 years, I probably, you know, taught mostly composition, um, some, some fiction writing, but, but mostly composition. So there was, there was that part of the career that was in some cases a little bit deadly. Um, but the one thing about teaching a, a workshop is it forces you to, to break things down. So you know, those, those moments in a workshop are not necessarily conducive to first drafts, but they sure are conducive to the second draft and trying to figure out, as Steve said, this is not working in this other person's work. And, and maybe, you know, something is going on in my own that I need to take a look at. And it does force you to become a little bit more like a plumber or a carpenter than some sort of hoity-toity artist. Um, with your head in the clouds. I mean, you gotta take some time to figure out how the damn thing works uh, rather than just sort of putzing around, so. All right, excellent. Well, that brings us to about our time. I'll turn a little back over to Jefferson in a sec to close things out, but just personally for me, let me say thanks to you both for, for writing these books, for sharing them with us tonight. Thanks, Steve, for treating us to a Krakow sunrise uh, back behind you tonight. No uh, kidding. <laughs> and, thank uh, you, Ethan. Hope you're able to catch some, some good rest after this. But thanks again for staying up. Uh,